So what's the worst romance decision you've ever made? Dating, sex, marriage, whether you're young or old, doesn't matter. What's the worst romance decision you've ever made? How many of you are sitting next to your worst romance decision? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. Do not raise your hand. Uh, my, my worst, uh, my, mine began in kindergarten. Uh, I have two enduring memories of kindergarten. One was as an introvert, not being able to communicate really well with my teacher that I needed to go to the bathroom so she didn't give me the hall pass until the very last second. And so how many of you have ever, as kids, literally peed your pants? Raise your hand. Come on, raise the hands. Hold them up proud, proud, loud and proud. So I literally peed straight down my pants. This was in the 70s. We had things called moon shoes that had really cushy soles. So when I stepped in my shoes, it went, so that was awesome. That was awesome. And then there was a girl that I was just so sweet on. She was just, oh, I loved her in kindergarten. I knew we were going to get married. I loved her so much. And so I thought at, 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 re at recess, what better way to show her how much I loved her than to ask her to wrestle. And uh, I, heard her, I heard her arm. She started crying. I immediately ran to the teacher. I started telling on myself that I hurt her arm and I felt so bad. And that, to me, sort of describes a relationship between a man and a woman. Women are these lovely people who have to try to have a relationship with men who only know how to wrestle and pee down their legs. That is, that is basically, basically romance in a nutshell. What I love about the Bible is that the Bible never shies away from real life. The Bible tells story after story of people that have communication problems and sex problems and there's brokenness and divorce and shame and regrets. And that's why, man, you go through the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis tells it like it is. And what we're going to do today is we're going to go to the book of Ruth. And we're going to look at a story that I started at the end of June, if you were here. If you weren't here, that's okay. We're going to bring you up to speed. But the story of the book of Ruth. Now, the book of Ruth is found where in the Bible? How many of you, you know your Old Testament books of the Bible? You ready? Here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Just stop right there. Who isn't saying anything? Look over and give them a look of shame right now. Shame. Here we go. All right, Southern Baptists, you ready for me? Those of you who went to Bible churches, let's do this. You know, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, and Ruth. Now, Judges and Ruth are companion books. The book of Ruth begins in the days of the Judges. In Hebrew, it's in the days of the Shofets. Then This was a period of time after, you know, you have Abraham and then Moses comes along. And then you have the people of God before they get a king in this in-between time in, where God's people were trying to live. Nations were coming and attacking them all the time. And you know who ruled God's people? The, the Shofets. MMA fighters who were priests. Literally, people who had the ability to kill a lot of people, like Samson and Deborah. They protected the men and the women. I want to pause here and say, this week I asked Terry and Frank, do I spit when I preach? Do I? Raise your hand. Going to hell, going to hell, going to hell, going to hell. Here we go. All right. So back to the book of Ruth. What is the book of Ruth about? Let me, in 30 seconds, let me bring you up to speed. There's this woman named Naomi who has a husband named Elimelech. They have two sons. There is a famine in Bethlehem, which was a suburb of Jerusalem to the south. Bethlehem comes from the Hebrew, house of bread. A beautiful place. A place you could grow anything. But a famine came to Bethlehem. And so in order to provide for his family, Elimelech took Naomi and their two sons, and they went to a place called Moab. Moab is on the other side of the Dead Sea. The Moabites were hated by the Jews. Elimelech is like, how, how much does my life suck that I have to go to Moab to provide for my family? But we're going to do it anyway. And then while they were there, Naomi's two sons married Moabites, which is a little bit of a shame. But we're here, you're going to marry Moabites, whatever. 
They get married. Elimelech, her husband, dies. Her two sons die. So now she's stuck with these two Moabite girls. What am I going to do with you? Naomi says, I'm going to go back home. Turns around and tells Orpah, go ahead and leave. Orpah's like, yeah, okay, cool, and leaves. Na or Ruth turns around and says, oh, no, no, no. Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. Where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates us. And so Ruth and Naomi book back to Bethlehem. While they were in Bethlehem, in chapter 2 of the book of Ruth, it says that they just so happened to land next to a field that was owned by a distant family member of Naomi. His name was Boaz. And the Bible tells us he was hot. He was ripped and hot. <laughs> Not going to make another joke after that. Ripped and hot. Okay? And so Naomi turns on her matchmaking skills in chapter 3. And that's where we are. Naomi sends Ruth to go sort of connect with Boaz. How many of you are matchmakers, or there's someone in your family or a friend group where they're definitely matchmakers? Where they're like, right here, exactly. You're like, you know what? She would be great with him. Lisa does this all the time. He would be so good with her. She does this all the time. And if you just ask her if you're looking for something, she, she's all the time, she loves, loves doing that. And Naomi was the same way, but Naomi did it in a little underhanded way. Now, I'm going to read the chapter, but the first time I'm going to read it is I'm going to give you the Sunday school version. And then we're going to go back, and I'm going to give you the real version. And it's going to make a lot of you uncomfortable, but that's okay, because that's the point of the story. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down... Note the place where he is lying, then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the end of the grain pile. Ruth approached gently, uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman lying at his feet. Who are you, he asked. I am your servant Ruth, she said. Spread, your cor spread the corner of your garment over me, since you're a family guardian. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you as all you ask. All the people of my town know that you're a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I'm a family guardian, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night and in the morning. If he wants to do his duty as your family guardian, good, let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you're wearing and hold it out. And when she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, how did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, he gave me these six measures of barley saying, don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens, for the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. And there you have it. That is how Naomi fixed up Ruth 
with Boaz. Now the real version. Professor of mine at Princeton Seminary, world-famous Old Testament scholar, Catherine Dube Sackenfeld had a class on Ruth, with, which was just, just amazing. And here's what she pointed out. But before we get into that, I want to ask you the question again. What's the worst romance decision you've ever made? Think back. Think back to when you were dating. Think back to when you were married. Dating, sex, marriage, young, old, it doesn't matter. Think back to the worst decision that you've made. And keep that in mind as we now go back through the passage. It begins, verse 1. One day Naomi told her mother-in-law, My daughter, I must find a home for you where you'll be well provided for. And Boaz, with whose women you have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight, he's going to be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Now, the threshing floor, this was harvest season. And all the men of, of the tribe, not only family, but extended man, family and all of their friends, would go to the fields with the women and would pick all of the barley, come to the threshing floor, but imagine this circle went all the way around. This would have been a threshing floor. You throw it out onto the floor, and then you take a big rake, and you just beat it over and over again. And then everybody together will scoop it up, throw it up into the air, and the wind will take away the chaff. And what will be left on the bottom will be barley. And they will do this over and over and over and over again. At night, you are so tired because you're doing it from the time you get up until the time you go to bed. What will happen is the men will actually just sleep on the floor itself. And so tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Naomi says, I want to find a home for you. And in Hebrew, it means I'm going to find a place for you to rest. But the reality is, She's looking for a home for her. She's looking for a home, not just for Ruth, but also for her because she's going to need to be taken care of in her old age. Verse 3. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you're there until he's finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he's lying. Then go and uncover his feet. He will tell you what to do. I will do whatever you say, Ruth says. Now, there are a few things I want you to notice about this section of the scripture. Number one, women usually only washed, perfumed themselves, and put on their best clothes when they were going to have sex or they were going to get married after which they were going to have sex. And so what she was telling her to do was to prepare herself. The second thing that you need to know about this passage is that the winnowing floor was the hookup floor. It was the place every night during harvest season the prostitutes would come and essentially it was one big orgy. Places where prostitutes would come, they would find men who want to hook up and either on the floor or in the precincts somewhere on the compound they would have sex with prostitutes. The third thing that you need to know about this passage is that once you had sex in the Jewish mindset, you were considered married in the eyes of God. That's what a Jew believed. So keep that in mind. Once you were married in the eyes of, once you had sex, you were married in the eyes of God. Keep that in mind as we continue. Verse 7 when Boaz had finished eating and drinking, he was in good spirits. What does that mean? He was hammered. <laughs> Boaz, hammered, goes to the winnowing floor. He went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly. Why quietly? Number one, she didn't want to get taken advantage of by other people. Also, there were other people there doing other things. Uncovered his feet and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned and there was a woman lying at his feet. In other words, 
he goes and falls asleep on the winnowing floor, hammered. After the alcohol wears off, what? What is going on? Now, two things I want you to notice. First, the Hebrew word for uncover often means to uncover someone's nakedness. So already, a good Jew reading this book would have been like, I don't, I don't want to go anymore. That's it. Just tell it to me. Just tell it to me. I know I'm good. He un she uncovered his feet and lay down. And second, oftentimes in Hebrew, feet and legs, whenever feet and legs are used, oftentimes it's a euphemism for genitalia. So when the passage says that Ruth uncovered Boaz's feet or legs, it's a euphemism for his pee-pee, okay, which is another euphemism. You see where we're going? Okay. How do we know this? Well, let me just, I'll give you another uh, number of, of examples I can read through here, just a few. Exodus 4, 25, but Zipporah took a flint knife, cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet. Surely you're a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. And the only instance of God using a Brazilian wax is judgment. Isaiah 7.20. In the day the Lord will use a razor hired from Brian the Euphrates River. The king of Assyria is going to come and shave your head and the hair of your legs. And take off your beards too. What's he saying? It's going to get close. He's going to come to your very heart. That's how close the judgment of God is going to come to you, is that it's going to be like you're getting shaved all over your body. Ezekiel 16, 5, here's another instance. At every corner you built your lofty shrines and your degraded beauty, spreading your legs with increasing promiscuity to anyone who passes by. Spreading your legs is a euphemism for female genitalia. That the judgment that God is pronouncing through Ezekiel, that God's people are like prostitutes that are opening up their genitalia to anybody that comes along the street. That's the, the rage with which God is pronouncing judgment on God's people. So everyone gets this? So what Reef is doing is... Well, what you would find any other prostitute was doing on the floor that night. What you have to remember is that Ruth is not a Jew. Ruth is a Moabite. No code. This is, there's nothing absolutely wrong with this. And so when Boaz wakes up, who are you, he asked. I am your servant, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me since you are a family guardian. And so what does that mean? This is what that means. Really yep, you know exactly, right? You know exactly what's going on. Spread the corner of your garment over me. In June, I talked about how the book of Ruth is a book about faithfulness. How in the world does this convey faithfulness? What does this have to do for those of us who are disciples of Jesus that are learning how to be faithful? How is this hesed? Hesed is the Hebrew word that is the defining characteristic of God that says, I'm going to remain faithful to you even if you're faithless. Even if you cheat on me, I'm going to be faithful to you. And so in the first chapter, it makes sense. Ruth is faithful to Naomi and is not willing to leave her. I'm going to stick with you, faithful 100%. The second chapter, Boaz is faithful to Ruth. He doesn't take advantage of her in the fields when no one can find out like other men that are in the fields. But the third chapter, what is this about? How is this showing faithfulness? And what I need you to understand is that if you have intimacy in the eyes of God for a Jew, you're married. And so Boaz and Ruth have this experience. And Boaz shows faithfulness.
because when he gets up, he's going to make things right. I pointed this out to a friend, and she was like, I don't like what you're doing to Ruth. I'm like, it's not me. It's the story. This is real life. The book of Genesis, Abraham cheats on his wife. Abraham passes off his wife as a sister. David has an affair, and then Ruth and Boaz do this. But what's the point of the story? The point of the story, I mean, Boaz, see, here's the thing. If you're going to look in judgment on anyone, you need to do it first on Naomi, who knew exactly what she was doing, putting Ruth into this situation. You need to look at Boaz, who said, no one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. So I want to go back to that question I asked you a few minutes ago. What's the worst romance decision you've ever made? Dating sex, marriage, whether you're young or old, doesn't matter. The Lord bless you, my daughter. This kindness is greater than that to which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or old. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. Now what has happened, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask, and the people of my town know that you're a woman of noble character, and what is faithfulness in the story? What is faithfulness is that Boaz gets up and he makes things right. Here's what I want you to write down. Here's what I want you to remember. This is what the book of Ruth is teaching us. Sometimes you make the right decisions. Sometimes you make decisions right. I'll often ask someone, I love this church. I love the people in the church. I love the culture in this church. Because people can come, like we're all broken, but people will come and they don't feel shame. And they will, so I'll have a conversation and we'll go like this. So how'd you two meet? And then there will be this awkward pause. And I'm like, it was in a bar, weren't you? And uh, they'll, they'll say, yeah. I was like, you were hammered, weren't you? Yeah. And they'll say, yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, what stays in Vegas doesn't stay in Vegas. I got a five-year-old now. You know, I have a six-year-old now, right? And I'm like throw my arms around him, I love you. I love you that you're here and you're wanting to make things right. Now, the Bible's clear about how sex ought to operate. 1 Corinthians 6, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins people commit are outside their bodies, but those who sin sexually, sin against their own bodies. You carry it. You feel it. It eats you up inside. It is different from other sins. All sins are equal in the eyes of God, but the ramifications are not equal in how we experience them and feel them. Little light, white lie you tell someone is fundamentally different from having sex before marriage or having homosexual sex. God is very clear. When God gives a command about sex, he's not trying to be a buzzkill. He's trying to protect us from something and provide us with something. Here's what God tells us about sex. When you are dating, no touching underneath. If I want you to imagine you got a bikini on. Now, for some of you who are men, that would not be a good-looking sight. That would, but I want you to imagine you have a bikini on. Nothing under the bikini gets touched. Nothing under the bikini gets touched. No sex until marriage. No affairs afterwards. Anything outside of that brings a massive pile of pain on people's lives. I remember um, a number of years ago, I was preaching at a church planning banquet all over the state of New Mexico. The final night, um, we were in Las Cruces, which is just above the, New Mex or the Mexican border. And so half of the crowd only spoke Spanish, half of the crowd spoke English. And so we had all kinds of people shuttling up from Mexico. And so I'm speaking at this banquet, and I have an interpreter. And so I'm speaking, he interprets. I speak, he interprets. All of a sudden, we get into a rhythm. I'm saying like a sentence, he's saying like a paragraph, people are laughing. 
I say a sentence, he interprets it, goes on for another minute or two, people are laughing. Finally, I realize people from Mexico love me. Like, I am crushing it. I find out afterwards that the guy wasn't even really translating what I was saying. He was just going off, you know. So that night, everyone leaves. I'm in Las Cruces at this hotel. I think it was a day's end. And it was late. It was 1030. I'm exhausted. I've spoken in five different cities, if I remember correctly. And I'm hungry. Because whenever you speak at these things, you don't have an opportunity to eat. Everybody eats, but you're not eating. You're going over what you're going to say. So I'm starving. The only place that's open is a Krispy Kreme across the street. So I throw on a T-shirt and shorts, and I go to walk to get a Krispy Kreme. Now pause. Before I left, I have what I call a covenant partner, someone that knows the true condition of my soul at all times is willing to ask me any and all questions, do gut checks, surprise inspections at any time about anything, free open access to my soul. So I tell him, hey, listen, I'm going to be there for a whole week speaking, and I'm going to be in the middle of nowhere, and there will just be a lot of temptation. It wasn't until I started traveling that I realized the amount of temptation that comes in business travel. The amount of people that go and hook up at the bar at hotels, it's shocking. It's shocking the temptation that those of you who travel in business and the hooking up that goes in business all the time, some of you know what that is because you're doing it. So I'm there in Las Cruces. I get up. I'm starving, and I'm going down the hallway, and this beautiful woman is standing at the door at the end of this long, dark hallway. And she's urging me to come in. And as soon as she did that, I had one thought. I have a hankering for Krispy Kremes. I'm going straight ahead. <laughs> now, I did. Now, I attribute that to my dad providing me a good example. Never travel and then go to the bar in a hotel. If you have to eat and you, they only have food at the bar, you get room service. You never go down at the bar. Um, gave me all kinds of tips because he was always traveling. I attribute that to my youth pastor. I attribute that to uh, all kinds of people. My wife. I attribute that also to my accountability partner. And the reason I'm saying attributing that is that I was in the middle of nowhere and no one ever would have known. But I was able to withstand because of all of the influence that people have had in my life and that my friend was praying for me. FYI, Lisa always says, you love telling that story, walking down the hallway and the hot woman wants to have sex. I'm like, shut up, no. <laughs> Those of you who are teenagers in the room, there's no one in, the, everyone in this room understands the pressure that you're under to have sex. All of your friends are having sex, all of them. What do you need to do when you leave today to go and make it right? Nothing under the clothes gets touched. Okay, you've made a mistake. Maybe you've gone too far. But sometimes you make the right decisions. Other times you make decisions right. What do you need to do to go out of this room and make that decision right? And it's not marriage, by the way. Just let me say that. <laughs> Those of you who are living together... You're having sex, and if someone asks you, you're a disciple of Jesus, but you're living together and having sex before marriage. You have all kinds of great reasons financially why this is, you think this is a good decision. What do you need to do to leave this room and go make that decision right? Those of you who are in the middle of an affair or in the middle of an, a serial um, habit of hooking up on a regular basis. What do you need to do to leave and go make it right? Those of you who are looking at porn, what do you need to do to go and make that right? Those of you who are going to strip clubs, a disciple of Jesus going to strip clubs, what do you need to do to go make that right? Those of you who are flirting, 
you enjoy the conversation of another woman or another man, what do you need to do to go and make that right? Those of you who have opened yourselves up to an affair, what do you need to go, do to go make that right? Here's the thing, listen, sometimes you don't make the right decision. But as disciples of Jesus, you go and you make the decision right. Out of love for Jesus, and out of love for yourself, and out of love for other people. That is what this story is about. And so God, we just pray, thank you for showing us the example of people who eventually become the ancestors of Jesus. Help us, God, the temptation that we feel in this culture, the pressure that we feel, the perversion that happens in our culture, what we see on television, what we see on the internet. God, help us to withstand this evil, this perversion of this amazing gift that you've given us. Even though we may not have made the right decisions, you can forgive us and empower us to go and make these decisions right. We pray that you would give us the strength to do this. We pray in Jesus' name. Thanks for watching today's message. Make sure to check out Brian's new book, Finding Favor, God's Blessings Beyond Health, Wealth, and Happiness. To sign up for Brian's newsletter, please go to Brian's website at brianjones.com.